Andrew Pickering is internationally known as one of the founders of Science and Technology Studies, also known as STS. He holds a PhD in Physics from the University of London in 1973, as well as a PhD in Science Studies from the University of Edinburgh in 1984. He was a professor of sociology and a director of science and technology studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign until 2007. He held the chair of sociology at the University of Exeter and is since 2015 an emeritus professor in the department. Pickering has held multiple fellowships, including, for instance, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, at the Institute for Advanced Study at, Prince, at Princeton, and at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. He is the author of several influential books, for instance, Constructing Quarks, A Sociological History of Particle Physics, was published in 1984 and is a classic in the field of science studies, focusing on a history of the post-war conceptual development of elementary particle physics. The Mangle of Practice, Time, Agency and Science, published in 1995, is one of the most important books in STS, where Pickering develops a performative idiom to analyze scientific practice, focused on answers of agency between humans and non-humans. Pickering's most recent book, The Cybernetic Brain, Sketches of Another Future, published in 2010, presents British cybernetics as an example of nomad science and of non-modern ontologies, where the goal is not to control non-humans, but to engage in dances of agency with more than human agency, thus representing an alternative to dualist and mainstream formations of science, technology, and engineering. Professor Pickering is currently working on a new book. I have had the privilege to take a look at some of the draft chapters that explores non-modern and poetic ways of acting and engaging with the environment. And today, his keynote, keynote talk is entitled Closer to the World, Doing Without Science. So Professor Pickering, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and the floor is all yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Antonio. Thank you for inviting me to this meeting. It looks extremely interesting. I think you just said I was going to kickstart the meeting. <laughs> I'm not sure I could do that on a Monday morning. Oh, it's a Tuesday morning, but uh, I'll, I'll try anyway. Okay. Um, talking about the an Anthropocene reminds us that we're strongly coupled to the non-human world. What we do matters. We arrange the world to suit ourselves, but this has a dark side. It leads to enormous unintended side effects, which bounce back at us. We all know that. The usual list is global warming, the extinction of species, environmental disasters, economic inequalities, we can't get rid of this coupling to the world. We're in the world, whether we like it or not. But the question for me is whether we could couple ourselves into the world different. Could we act differently to attenuate the dark side of our presence here on Earth? That's what I want to think about this morning. And to begin, I need to get clearer on this idea of acting different. What does it mean? First, to me, it means something more radical than just stopping what we usually do or substituting one technology for another, such as replacing oil-fired power stations with solar energy. I'm all in favour of such changes, but I'm after something more fundamental. I'm looking for a different pattern of acting in the world from our usual one, which is something only a few people think about. Maybe this conference will help me. So this is a strange project, but I want to follow it through. And the first step is to characterize what I think of as our usual pattern of acting in the world. This is a stance of dualist domination. We act as if we are special, the lords of creation, transforming what we like to think of as a docile world to suit our own ends. This is the stance that Martin Heidegger called enframing, 
treating the world as standing reserve, which has got us into so much trouble and which we can think of as acting on the world. And then this other stance that I want to explore, this other pattern of acting, would have to acknowledge instead that in fact we live in a lively world that we can't control and that we therefore have to learn to get along with. This is the stance that Heidegger, I think, called poesis, which we can think of as acting with the world rather than on it. So this is the contrast that I'm interested in, and in framing versus poesis, acting on versus, versus acting with. We're all very familiar with enframing and its many dark signs. But the poetic acting with stance is much less familiar, I think. And my goal today is to try to bring poesis to life, to make it imaginable. I'm currently writing a book, as Antonio mentioned, that goes through several examples of poesis in action, including styles of water management, rewilding, ecosystem restoration, farming, Aboriginal burning, and communicating with spirit. And I should say that Antonio's comments on my drafts have been very useful. Thank you very much, Antonio. Keep up the good work. Um, I'll run through one of my examples um, with farming in a minute. But first, I can mention some key aspects of all of the examples, what runs through them all. Here's a list. One, my examples are strange. They concern ways of engaging with nature that I could never have imagined before I began this project. This is one obvious sense in which there are instances of a different pattern of being in the world. Two, and framing is a sort of master-slave relation, which distances us from the world. Nothing comes back from the slave to the master. Poesis, in contrast, hinges on an intimate reciprocal engagement which brings us closer to nature. In the end, I think, this might be what we need most. Three, my examples all center on agency and performance. Our agency as humans, but also the agency of the non-human world. Acting on the world presumes that we are the only agents around. Acting with acknowledges that that isn't true. The world itself is a lively place that we need to collaborate, work together with. Four, in poesis, knowledge is less important. Knowledge is less important than action and performance. And framing depends on modern science and technology. And we're continually instructed by governments, corporations, even philosophers, to look to science to solve the world's problems. But science, I reckon, is a part of the problem. And it is at most a side issue to the poetic projects that I've been examining. It interests me a lot that there's a pattern of acting in the world that doesn't hinge on science and that is presently overshadowed by science. Part of my project is to foreground the strange pattern of doing without science, as I like to call it. Perhaps this is the most striking aspect of my attempt to find other ways of coupling ourselves into the world. Five, this brings us to a very important topic I won't have a chance to discuss in this talk, namely education. The current emphasis in education on so-called STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and medicine, is a curriculum for end framing. It's an interesting question, how we could teach people poesis instead. 
Certainly nobody ever taught it me, and I've spent a long time in universities over the years. Okay, if poesis is a strange way of being in the world, we need an example to hang on to. I thought today i talk about something we all depend upon, namely farming. Since World War II, farming has become overwhelmingly techno-scientific, dependent on chemical fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, selective breeding, genetically modified organisms, statistics and optimization. At the same time, its dark side has become apparent, including all sorts of environmental pollution, ecological damage, and major contributions to global warming. Modern farming is a kind of arms race with nature. So now I'm going to talk about an alternative approach, so-called natural farming, as developed in Japan by a chap called Masanobu Fukuoka in the 1913 to 2008, and described by him in several books, beginning with the most famous one, The One Straw Revolution published in 1978 in English. The first point to emphasize is just how strange and different Fukuoka's natural farming is from conventional approaches. Its most striking feature is its do nothing stance. In contrast to conventional farming, the land isn't plowed or worked over in any way, no weeding is done, and no sustained flooding, as is the case usually in rice farming. No chemicals are used, either as fertilizer or pesticide. Natural farming is thus so different that when I first heard of it, I was shocked, shocked. <laughs> I live in the English countryside. If you looked out the window in front of me, you could see it. And I'm used to seeing farmers plough their land every year. And the possibility that you can farm without ploughing never crossed my mind before. If I were Japanese, the non-flooding of rice fields would, I'm sure, have shocked me just as much. I therefore want to ask first how this strange and radical form of do-nothing agriculture arose, and then what its mature form looks like, emphasizing what I take to be the poetic aspects of both. We can start with Fukuoka's path to natural farm, his path to how he got there. He recalls that it began in 1938 with a spontaneous revelation that we, humanity, are doing too much, setting ourselves apart from nature as its master. This, of course, is then framed. And Fukuoka thought that it must be possible to get out of it, to remain closer to nature, and to take part in the to take part in the natural flow of events instead of ordering them around, to act with nature, poesis. He set out to test this idea, working initially on his father's land. And his first thought was literally to do nothing, absolutely nothing, simply to let his father's orchards go, not to look after them at all. This failed completely. All of the trees died. Since that failed, he then took a more active role, looking for ways to approach his goal progressively rather than in a single leap. After World War II, he turned to raising crops and to avoid weeding herbicides and fertilizers, he began by planting clover as ground cover, that would enrich the soil while inhibiting weeds. That worked. To avoid fertilizers, he realized that he had to return as much goodness as possible to the land each year. So he redistributed all the straw that remained after threshing each crop as mulch. That ran into difficulties 
looking more closely, it seemed the problem was that he'd thrown the mulch onto the land in clumps or distributed it too carefully and geometrically. But either way, the mulch was inhibiting <laughs> the mulch was inhibiting <laughs> the germination of the crops. And trying it another way, he discovered that mulching was a success if he simply cast the straw randomly across the land. Many more twists and turns followed. In the early days, he found it necessary to control insects with a natural insecticide, pyrethrum. But as his fields developed, he found he could dispense with that too, another not doing. Sparrows were a big problem, pecking up the seed as quickly as he threw it across the ground. Quote, I tried scarecrows and nets and strings of rattling cans, but nothing seemed to work very well. The solution proved to be a new chore, coating the seeds with mud pellets before sowing them. Fukuoka found that if he let ducks wander on his fields, their droppings would help the mulch decompose more quickly. Quote, I once thought there would be nothing wrong with putting ashes from the fireplace onto the fields. The result was astounding. Two or three days later, the field was completely bare of spiders. How many thousands of spiders fell victim to a single handful? of this apparently harmless ash. Anyway, the upshot of this complex process was the mature form of natural farming. Fukuoka, in the end, learned how to obtain good yields of crops with a minimum of effort, while dispensing with otherwise definitive elements of farming, such as plowing, weeding, flooding, the use of chemicals and without much hard labor. I'm going to talk about this mature form next, but first I want to comment on the path to it. And I want to emphasize two points. First, it depended on a close and detailed engagement with nature. I used to live in the American Midwest and the work of farming there involved little more and sowing genetically modified corn and soya beans, spraying them with a variety of chemicals, and then harvesting them, basically following a set procedure with little genuine engagement with the land. Fukuoka instead had a hands-on experimental engagement, not just with his land <clears throat> and crops, but also with sparrows, mice, chicken droppings, mud, spiders, etc. He knew his world much more intimately than is possible in the usual forms of industrial farming. That's what I meant earlier by getting closer to nature. Second, this closeness involved almost no knowledge and no chemicals, no statistical optimization or whatever. The closeness was performative. It centered on what I call a dance of agency, a back and forth of Fukuoka, Fukuoka's actions and the actions of the land, the seeds and whatever. He tried just doing nothing and his orchard died. In response, he tried doing something else so in clover, and the weeds slowed in their growth in turn. The sparrows ate the seeds, so he experimented with coating them in mud, and then the sparrows acted differently, and so on. Staging these back and forth dances of agency like that is at the heart of all of my examples of poesis, not just this one. And to repeat all of these examples, center on performance, not on knowledge or techno science. That's the sense in which there are a different way of being and acting in the world from our usual forms of enframing. They are doing without science. Now I want to talk about the mature form of natural farming as a more or less stable technique. 
Here's an account of Fukuoka's pattern. Quote, in the fall, Mr. Fukuoka sows the seeds of rice, white clover, and winter grain onto the same field and covers them with a thick layer of rice straw. The grain and clover sprout up right away. The rice seeds lie dormant until the spring. The rye and barley are harvested in May and they're threshed. All the straw is scattered, unshredded, across the field. Water is then held in the field for a short time. Once the field is drained, the clover recovers and spreads beneath the growing rice plants. The rice is harvested in October and autumn seeding follows the cycle. What can we say about this? First, it works. Fukuoka obtained comparable or superior yields to conventional farming techniques. Second, we can note the striking absence of the key elements of enframing, plowing, weeding, extensive flooding, transplanting, chemicals. Third, the, th <clears throat> the dance of agency has now been regularized as what I call a choreography of agency, a stabilized tuning in and gearing together of human and non-human performance. The timing of planting and reaping the different crops, rice and grain, is so contrived that their growing seasons overlap. In this way, each fosters the growth of the other while inhibiting the weeds. Likewise, the alternation of crops is a self-acting form of disease control because rice diseases die out during the grain phase and vice versa. The rice, grain, clover, weeds and water thus act together in different combinations at different times of the year to achieve the desired outcome. The actions of the farmer are, of course, coupled directly into this choreography as part of the poetic process. And the timing of human interventions is in fact more closely coupled with non-human agency than I've so far said. For example, speaking now of growing vegetables, quote, <clears throat> the important thing is knowing the right time to plant. For spring vegetables, the right time is when the winter weeds are dying back and just before the summer weeds have sprouted. For the fall sowing, seeds should be tossed out when the summer grasses are fading away and winter weeds have not yet appeared. It's best to wait for a rain, which is likely to last for several days. I don't know how you know it's likely to last, but that's what you do. This is the sense that natural farming is a poetic process, very different from conventional farming. The natural farmer appears as a partner of the land, acting with nature and tuned into its rhythms and its agency in the plane of practice, as I used to say, rather than hovering above it in a position of mastery. So natural farming is my example today of poesis. It's strange and different from techno-scientific farming. It's a different pattern of acting in the world, acting with rather than acting on, and it works. It shows us that we can act differently in the world if we want to. Fukuoka also notes the obvious, that natural farming is environmentally benign, enriching rather than degrading the soil and avoiding all the environmental damage associated with plowing and chemical inputs and runoffs and things like that. Now I want to examine it from a couple of further angles. First, I've talked about poesis as doing without science, and this is literally true of natural farming. No science, no details through labs or chemical factories were involved. 
either in Fukuoka's path to natural farming or in its mature form. And it interests me a lot that Fukuoka himself developed an ontological critique of science, which we can talk about now. Fukuoka originally trained and worked as a scientist, and he never disputed individual pieces of scientific knowledge. His concern was with the difficulty of putting individual bits of science together as a useful picture of farming. We can see how this goes by looking at his ideas about pest control. He discusses, for example, Japanese attempts to protect pine trees from an outbreak of weevils by spraying them with pesticide from helicopters. Quote, I don't deny that this is effective in the short run, but I know there must be another way. Weevil blights, according to the latest research, are not a direct infestation, but follow upon the action of nematodes. The nematodes breed within the trunk and eventually cause the pine to wither and die. The ultimate cause is not yet clearly understood. Nematodes feed on a fungus within the tree's trunk. Why did this fungus begin to spread? Did the fungus begin to multiply after the nematode had already appeared? Or did the nematode appear because the fungus was already present? Furthermore, there's another microbe which always accompanies the fungus and a virus which is toxic to the fungus. Effect following effect in every direction. The only thing that can be said with certainty is that pine trees are withering. <coughs> I'm running through, <coughs> sorry, all of Fukuoka's thinking. One finds this image of the world as a great chain of being, a web of endlessly interacting dances of agency, which is, according to Fukuoka, ultimately unknowable. You can eradicate the weevils, but this just leaves the nematodes, funguses, viruses, and whatever, to do their thing in the new context, whatever that will turn out to be. This is how the world is, and this is what defeats the efficacy of science in farming. And of course, this is what motivates a poetic and performative, experimental, rather than cognitive and scientific approach to farming, like Fukuoka. Fukuoka's ontology also points to an endless epistemological regress of scientific expertise. I like Quote, methods of insect control which ignore the relationships among the insects are truly useless. Research on spiders and leaf hoppers will also need to consider the relation between frogs and spiders. So a frog professor will also be needed. Experts on spiders and leaf hoppers, another on rice and another expert on water management will all have to join the gathering. Furthermore, there are four or five kinds of spiders in these fields, etc., etc. And I realize it's funny, but it isn't a joke. In my university, for example, scientific workshops on Gaia are full of grad students and postdocs, all chipping away at individual little bits of the puzzle in an apparently never ending fashion. This is how science works, actually. And beyond that, Fukuoka's ontological vision also has practical implications. If we can never fully know the endless web of nature, interfering with it and framing again is liable to end in disaster. Quote, people can't know what the true cause of the pine blight is, nor can they know the ultimate consequences of their remedy. If the situation is meddled with unknowingly, that only sows the seeds for the next great catastrophe. And of course, this isn't a joke at all. We could think here of Rachel Carson's classic book, Silent Spring from 1962, 
on the unexpected side effects of using DDT to kill insects. DDT kills insects, but it also turned out to kill populations of songbirds. How then should natural farming respond to pests, if not by eliminating? Fukuoka's basic idea is that with more poetic experimentation, land becomes resistant to pests as pests and their predators come into dynamic equilibrium with one another. The dance of agency more or less choreographs itself. Quote, it is undesirable to eliminate predators because greater insect damage will result if insect communities are left to achieve their natural balance, the problem will generally take care of itself. This won't work if an organic phosphorus pesticide has already been used, since the predators are killed by this chemical. Just as the basic form of natural farming had to be found in performative experimentation, then so do modulations of it, such as pest control. This experimentation, poesis, acting with nature, according to Fukuoka, is, in general, the appropriate way to act with the unknowable web of life. So Fukuoka's ontology hangs together with this performative approach to acting with nature and with his critique of science. But he was, if he was against science, I want to close by noting some other non-scientific ontological understandings that actually resonate with and support Fukuoka. First, from my point of view, his ontology is, in fact, the one I arrived at in my studies of the history of physics in my old book, The Mangle of Practice from 1995. We have the same picture of him. If scientific knowledge indeed sets the world up for enframing, my argument in the mangle was that genuine scientific research is itself poetic experimentation in an ultimately unknowable world. So personally, I think that Fukuoka's ontology is just right. And natural farming for me is one of many examples of the mangle, as I call it, in action. And my political project is to map out and connect these examples across different fields as instances of an overall non-modern paradigm of acting in the world. My book, The Cybernetic Brain, was another part of the same project. I want to link cybernetics to Fukuoka's natural farm and many other things besides. But to finish, I want to think about ontology from a different angle. I find it revealing to connect natural farming to Eastern philosophy. I want to think about two key concepts. First, the Chinese idea of Shi, S-H-I, which I believe you should really pronounce Shu or something, Shu, but I pronounce it Shi, which Francois Julien translates as the propensity of things, the disposition of things to act in specific ways, in specific contexts. From our perspective, the attractive feature of Shi is that it indeed refers directly to performance, action, doing things. It's not a scientific concept. Just what she is can itself seem foggy and mysterious, but natural farming can help us to understand it. En route to natural farming, Fukuoka explored the propensities to act, the trees, rice, barley, rice, clover, weeds, birds, water, and the land. Finally, finding a complicated circular choreography of she, propensity. So just as enframing acts out a dualist and mistaken 
Western ontology of man's dominion over nature, so natural farming and poesis in general can be seen to act out an Eastern ontology of sheep. And then we can think of Fukuoka's minimalist approach to farming as an example of Wu Wei, W-U-W-E-R, a key concept of Taoism usually translated as not doing. I think Wu Wei can mean not doing in a very literal sense. Fukuoka described the route to natural farming quite often as, let's try not doing this, then we will try not doing that, meaning plowing, weeding, fertilizing. But in natural farming, these literal not doings are themselves entwined with a more sophisticated sense of latching onto and gracefully inserting the farmer into the agency of nature in complex choreographies, as I call them. The overlapping of rice and winter crops, delicate timings of sowing and so on. Natural farming is thus, I think, a rich and nuanced exemplification of the Taoist concept of Wu Wei. And framing is the brutal contrast class here. And framing as our way, forcing the other into submission. And the conclusion of all this is then that ideas like Xi and Wu Wei offer us a nice and very direct way to think about poesis and what it looks like in practice. And of course, conversely, the unfamiliarity of Eastern philosophy to people like me helps to explain the difficulty that we moderns find in getting poesis into focus, to even see. It points to the need for a big paradigm shift of revolution in order to recognize and grasp the existence of patterns of practice different from and framing. Okay, and now I can just sum up quickly. I began with the perils of the Anthropocene as a reason to search for new ways, new patterns of acting in the world, ways of acting with rather than on the environment. I believe these alternative patterns can be found and natural farming was my example. These patterns are strange to most of us. They're performative ways of doing without science. And the switch to Eastern philosophy just now is one way to get at this strangely. These patterns, so to speak, undercut modernity and the Anthropocene from below. In as much as projects like natural farming grow and prosper, they denaturalize our usual mode of end framing and domination by revealing it to be a dangerous choice rather than the one best way to go on in the world. In a kind of feedback loop that promises to couple us into the world different in a more intimate, benign and graceful fashion. As my friend and colleague, Steve Hinchliffe recently wrote, echoing John Lennon of all people, quote, Instead of the war that is then framing, poesis gives peace a chance. And that's why it interests me so much. That's the end. Thank you very much for listening to me.